Hey everyone, in today's episode I spoke with Scott Hoffman, founder of It's All Good Media. Scott credits automation with opening up more time for his team to focus on building relationships with his clients, and he shared some tips and stories with me about the success his agency has seen here recently. We also discussed retargeting strategies, why attribution can be so tricky, and how he wants his clients to think of him even after he's finished working with them. A bunch of great stuff in this one, so let's get into it. So this episode, we're really talking about uh, what our agency partners are doing today, what's working for them, what's not working for them. And today's episode, we have Scott Hoffman, who is joining us. He's spending about 45 minutes to an hour with us, just sort of talking through some of these things and what he's seeing in his agency. So Scott, it's great to have you. Oh man, sure glad to be invited. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, so I think when we talked, we first met sort of on on LinkedIn. We were just kind of com- conversing. We were actually talking over a uh, certification that one of our partner agencies had re- just recently received, and you jumped in, which I really thought was cool. Like you, you were like, "Yeah, it's a, it's another agency, but like you know how hard those things are to to achieve when you get that that status." Uh, when did you get your When did you get your status? as a certified agency. Our, we got our platinum status, I want to say four years ago, three years yeah. ago, four years ago. Um, yeah. And so one of the state segments is it requires two people, you know, two people to get that platinum yeah. level. Yeah. And on your um, team. Yeah. so, uh, yeah. So our CTO and myself have been with Sharp Spring for this is our seventh year. And so we're pretty familiar with it. We run anywhere between 15 to 20 active clients. And so a few of them are, most all of them are, are tigers or nobody's a dragon yet. You, know, you, you, you can't get a dragon. I don't know how cool you got to be for that, but <laughs> um, we have quite a few super users on it, which is great. It keeps us on our toes, you know, yeah. so um, yeah. it's a game changer for sure. Yeah, I, th- I think, you know, just understanding the utilization of the platform and understanding like what all of the different features and all of the different pieces of the platform are is, is a, um, can be overwhelming. And, and I say that knowing full well, that that's probably not the smartest thing to say on a, on an open podcast like this, because, you know, we want people to sign up for the product, but I, but I think where people, uh, see the, the value in something like SharpSpring in that onboarding process. And I'm going to ask you for, you know, in a minute, just like kind of what your experience was, but what is really like what we do, what we train our onboarders to do is really just pick a specific use case that that agency wants to solve and, and then center around that and get them success around you know, around that. And then you move on to something else. You move on to the next thing, but it's like any other either platform or, or tool or, you know, any, any other project, like I'm thinking like a home improvement project. If you think you're going to just overhaul the entire house, right. And, and get the final product and you try to do it all at the same time, it's overwhelming. Like you have to start uh, sec- sectioning it off so that you pick one thing to do at a time, pick the most important thing to you, right? And then you work your way through it until you get to the end. And I think that's kind of like what this is, right? Where you're, you are looking at a lot of different pieces and it can be overwhelming right out of the gate. But if you pick one thing that you really need to see results on and you want to get started with, then that's the thing you start with and then you, you branch out from there. Yeah, I think that's you. You hit the you hit the nail really good on that one. Where it's too, there's just too much. I mean, if, for us to go soup to nuts, platform services, all that. I mean, I, I actually I just did this presentation about a year or so to go with a client, and on the first slide it says, you know, welcome any questions, and the next slide says slide two of 187, and that was on the bottom of it, right? And they were like, what? And I'm like. I'm just kidding, but I just wanted to tell you I could do 187 slides. I'm only going to do 11, right. but there's that many features that we could go. Yeah. And it was, you know, it, you try to like, all right, let's calm the room down a little bit. Yeah. And we do on our site, since we're a user, I mean, we use SharpSpring as our 
uh, marketing automation system and our campaign tracker and all that stuff. So the first thing I'm able to do normally with a client is say, this is a really cool tool that'll help with the other stuff. By the way, this is what I know about you. And so I have interacted with them two or three times via email through my smart mail. Um, we might have played the game, you know, played a card game or something, and they thought that was cool. I got them over to a landing page, so that was pretty neat. So now I'm able to show them, I'm like, this is what I know about you. And then as an agency and researcher, I know where they live. I know where their kids go to school, all spooky, spooky stuff, you know. Yeah. And so now I'm able to put all this information. They're like, how do you know all this? Oh, this is a picture of you and your kids, you know. And I said, do you imagine this? with every one of your potential leads yeah. that you knew this much information. Yeah. And uh, that usually opens the door and then I can kind of layer things one after another after another. Yeah. So I think, I think what's interesting to me is that people have been talking a lot recently. Uh, if you just read any, any of the more recent blogs or, you know, you're, you're checking out LinkedIn, people talk a lot about dark social. Right. And dark social being like that area that is very hard to track that is influencing people's buying behavior before they ever even visit your site. And so one of the things that I am primarily interested in for our own marketing purposes is really just understanding what are the activities that we are currently doing? What are the campaigns that we're running that are are either in awareness or consideration, right? Where they are thinking about a solution. They are being made aware of their pain point, right? And they are having a conversation elsewhere, right? They're not on our site. They're not looking around for a solution yet, but they're still in that, uh, you know, sort of gather, you know, information gathering stage, a lot of times what they're doing is, you know, they're on social or they are, you know, it's a word of mouth thing where they're talking to a colleague or, you know, somebody is looking at G2 and G2 is, you know, looking at, you know, you're like your top 50, you know, people that are in marketing automation or, or whatever. And, you know, people are, people are searching differently uh, and, and sort of pre-qualifying, for lack of a better word, the potential solutions before they ever even come and check out your website and think, you know, and see your value proposition and, and you know, get to uh, get to that point where they're actually in a uh, sort of a decision making or buying buying stage. And one of the things that I like is how I can tie what we call the life of the lead to some of that behavior, right? And see sort of what's happening. Cause we all sort of know that, that no two buyer journeys are the same, right? You know, somebody comes in one way, you know, the next person comes in completely different. Um, and one of the things that we always sort of look at is how do we fig as marketers, how do we figure out how to connect the dots between the, uh, awareness related campaigns that we're running elsewhere in let's say paid social to uh, sort of influence the uh, behavior that we want people to to follow, to come to our website, check our, out our, you know, content, check out a, you know, problem solution page, check out our pricing, you know, kind of get a good feel for what the product is, determine whether or not, you know, we are a potential solution for them and then going to, you know, a, a, a free trial or a get a demo page, right. To, to, you know, have actually talk to a sales rep and, um, most tools, if you think about it, most individualized tools, I think you'll probably appreciate this because you have clients I know that have bunches of different tools, but they don't have one single solution, right. Um, where they're looking at things and they're saying, I don't get that vis like I don't see that visibility. I don't see everything that you're seeing, and there's they tend to be sort of blown away when you show them what you can do with the life of the lead, like you just described. Um, and so I'm just kind of curious, like is that does that happen a lot? How many of your clients, for example, have uh, 
individual sets of tools, like one, one tool for email, one tool for chatbot, one tool for a landing page builder, one tool for whatever, uh, attribution, right? Like what, how many, how many of your clients are typically set up that way? Well, they all pretty much start that way. You know, eventually everything gets kind of brought into the, to the, into the fold when you find out, you know, oh, we're using MailChimp or, constant contact or whatever. I'm like, okay, here's our email service providing solution that we have. And oh, by the way, it talks to this and it communicates with this. And so it builds value in that versus that data can't come from that the MailChimp or something like that. The chatbot too is another, uh, I think on our side, an underused service that is extremely powerful, like extremely powerful. This one client, we turned it on a few months ago, and in month number one, we had 98 conversations on the chat bot. And what the neat thing about it is, is that we also saw that on the, the chat bot lead is that they also interacted with Google ads yeah. and they also interacted with Facebook ads. And but yet they came from a, a Bing search, you know, and so now we're able to see all this stuff. And so when they say to us, hey, what was it that? you know, close this business. I said, all of it, you know, all of it, but it took the final trigger to make the other ones valuable. Yeah. If not, it goes underneath the unvaluable media or the, the non-interactive media. So it's almost like, uh, you know, we've tried 80 times and it hasn't worked. Well, 85 is what you needed and you just didn't do those last five. So now you're 80 or in the toilet. Yeah. And so, you know, let's continue to keep working it. And, and that seems to work pretty well. But here's a wild thing is uh, every client that we've come across on a new aspect, and I ask them simple questions like, who was on your website yesterday? And they're like, what? I'm like, like who? Do you know who was on there? Uh, no. I said, well, we can have it so that every one of your contacts, you'll know whether they were on your website yesterday. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, Do you know if anybody opened up your email that you sent them? I don't, I don't know. I, I, I can tell you for a fact, I can tell you whether they opened it or not you know, based upon the life of the lead and stuff. Yeah. Um, but it puts value to campaigns that weren't there before. So if you ask your Google ads guy, yeah. doesn't matter how much you spend. Yeah. If you spend another thousand dollars, it'll be more successful. And if you talk to your SEO guy, uh, you know, you need to just keep, you know, the more time and money you put into it, the better it's going to be. And you talk to your TV person, well, you should have bought the Super Bowl you know, versus the pregame and stuff like that. So it all kind of comes back as to where it really puts a value to closing that business and putting a good measurement on ROI. And the ROI measurement is incredible. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing else that I know on the market that can combine those different attributes in such an easy platform that after realistically six months, you get a really good look. And after a year or two years, I mean, today we're doing historicals for the last two years of the client. And we're able to say, you know, show agency growth and product growth and campaign growth. And here's these numbers and how they 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 touched each other. It, I, I couldn't have done that, you know, years ago. Yeah. Now it's just like, yeah, it's a button. Yeah. So <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what your agency specializes in. Like, well, originally we specialized in manufacturing co-oping. We were honored to have. Uh, a local John Deere dealer uh, as a client for many, many years. And, and they were the one that kind of really pushed a lot of these solutions because uh, we got hit with questions like, oh, we're spending a million dollars. How much of it is really worth it? And, you know, how much of our sales? And so we have to kind of push is what happens after the phone call, after the click, you know, and stuff. And, there, and I found this solution, which was Sharpspring and, and the life of the lead. And then the campaign tracking is like, okay, so now I can show you what this digital marketing is doing, what radio is doing, TV, billboards, and all that stuff. So we would work with the manufacturers and uh, work in co-op submissions and co-op approvals. And so we're over 8,000 submissions and uh, close to half a billion dollars in brand you know, features over our past 20 years. Um, and that has shifted quite a bit. Meaning is, is that most of those brands are just kind of giving back the retailers the dollars and just say, spend it however you're going to spend it. In certain industries, business is good. I mean, like real good. 
And so they haven't been as tight as they were in the past. But the digital aspect and the understanding of the digital world and how it relates um, to a, a particular client and their sales, we were we were kind of interested years ago. And so now it's kind of like a, a standard, you know, a conversation was in a meeting the other day as to where, how are you handling the virtual thing? I'm like, we've always been virtual. I mean, yeah. We are, we are, when you have clients all over the place, you're either jumping on planes, yeah. driving for hours in a car, or you're on Skype. Now we're on Zoom because we think it's a better product. And, you know, but we're, we're where our client needs us to be. And so we're, our technology kind of changes along with that, you know. And um, so try and stay on point, which for me, my mind runs a million miles an hour. So. Well, so it's interesting to me, right? So you, you, are, you've, you have a niche uh, that you are focused on. And then of those clients that you've brought in, um, have they always been in sort of that, that same space or do they, are they mostly B2B or they B2C or they both like what, what is the, how do you, how does that break down in terms of the clients that you have? You said you've got, so, well, well, on our side, on, on our side, it was it started as B 2 C, and we've been honored enough to have clients, you know, uh, that have allowed us to go into the B two B market, a B two G market. Um, government is, you know, a huge, uh, uh, huge form of business, uh, even on a local municipality aspect. So, yeah. you know, understanding that and and the elements of that at the end of the day the transaction is still the transaction someone's got to give a check for something you know and so we're dealing with humans and so a lot of your philosophies of marketing for a b2c situation will work with b2b because people want to do business with people they like yeah. and and with products and brands that they prefer yeah. uh, and then a b2g price is usually always the thing yeah because the lowest bid wins, yeah. you know, yeah. but on the other side there is when they can't meet their contractual obligations, price goes out the window. Yeah. And that's where the marketing after the transaction, we lost the bid. Okay, great. Let's keep communicating with them. Because if that guy, if we could barely make it at that price, there's no way they're going yeah. to, let's just wait for them to drop the ball. Yeah. And then we come in and we pick up the ball afterwards. But yeah. Yeah, those are, there's not an element, I think those are the three elements that we concentrate on fairly regularly here. Uh, the B2B is a big one, but the B2C is, the consumer base is, is awesome. And, you know, it's the funnest, I think, because you can, you really see that message out there. We, that we've had playoff football games and we have clients that are on the football games, which is, you know, that's always cool to see your client on TV. And then you hear them on the radio and you see them on Google and Facebook and all that yeah. stuff. So. Uh, that's always a fun thing. So of the B2B clients that you have, do they typically have sales teams where you're creating the leads and then handing them off to sales? Is that typically how it's done? How, well, the B2B, uh, I'll use one for an example, is is that um, it's a contractor with subcontractors and their government uh, are contracts. So their contracts are, their bids are pretty complex uh, and the bid system is pretty complex. So we built a document storage delivery security system for them. And then it works with SharpSpring mm. because we use our email marketing and then the criteria for the custom fields. So the subcontractors, let's say, for instance, in a certain situation, Largo is getting a new product, new thing out, but it has to be 50 percent owned by minorities or females. And so they've they've sub we, we subcategorize their context based on those criteria. Um, and so when instead of the bid going out to everybody, it really hones down onto you can qualify to do bid to bid on this contract with us because you'll be able to do it after the fact. Yeah. Uh, and so that really, really fine tuning it and helping them fine tune it. And every time we do it, it's like, let's add one more to it. Let's add one more to it. I think that client, we have 72 different categories for each client. And so they can really drill down to where, you know, on a carpenter aspect, just trim guys and just trim guys that do door trim versus floor trim or, I mean, something really narrowed down like that, you know, so that, that works out pretty well there. Yeah. And, um, 
we have some environmental clients too that are that are the same kind of thing. Meaning is, is that they're really offering this service and um, the communication and connection is the key more than anything. It seems like so the more they know, the better it is, and the educated customer is usually the best. So on the government side, are you typically looking at state and local? as as potential prospects okay and then of those state and local are you going through like fed biz ops or you know whatever to to deliver those kinds of proposals or are you doing something different so in the, the clients in this these categories here they have internal uh people that run their bid boards and they're and, and uh, they're scouring them constantly yeah. Um, whether it be federal, uh, local, or municipality. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, they have their internal teams that, that can develop all these things. Then we kind of help them hand it off to that sub so we can get the everything timed out. So all your bids got to be in by next Tuesday, that kind of yeah. thing. And we're able to trigger reminders with um, a workflow and our, our action groups. So those things. So all these little tools work. You know, it's like they tell us, the situation or the or the problem they have, and we go, well, these are some solutions that work in this category. Yeah. Let's implement them into yours, and they'll fire off and they'll work automatically, and that usually works out pretty that well. That is cool. Okay, so you're using that yeah. as a sort of an a acquisition channel, right? That mm -hmm. lands you yep. lands you business. That's pretty neat. Uh, I think you might be the actually the first agency that I've talked to that that has sort of that strategy i'm sure there are others but you know in terms of the ones that i think i've interviewed so far that's that's the first time i've heard it so that's kind of neat we we could probably spend a whole when we have issues that. like this or communications or connections we really haven't found one that we haven't been able to figure yeah. out meaning is is that you know if you've got a plus b equals c we can figure out the points in there and then and you know make those make those triggers happen or at least try at least so so let me ask a different question um as an agency um, what is sort of the like number one thing that you need to have nailed down and do really, really well in order to land a new client? Like what, what would be, it's either you gotta be known for something or you guys, you know, you, you've, well, I don't want to, I don't want to lead the witness. So I'll, I'll let you answer. <laughs> I'll lead the witness. Um, hmm, that's a good question there. Um, uh, so well, there's maybe, something maybe I that can I phrase it like it, it could be, mm -hmm. what are, what do you feel like clients know you at, like know you for really well that you do really well, that is what helps you land, land new business. Maybe that's a different way to say it. I as as with some a lot of businesses are specifically um referral is uh, obviously important and you know key yeah. um <clears throat> i think that communication that i constantly have with people and people i know that are in the industry outside the industry mm -hmm. um and making sure they understand what i do and what we're capable of doing yeah. and so far, and, and you know, I haven't been able to find somebody else in 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 this universe that I live in and and we live in that has all the touch points that we have internally. You know, some people are I hear these guys are good about this and these guys are good about this, and 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 I I, I know there's people that are better than us in a lot of things, and I think we're better than a lot of people in in certain things for sure. But one of the main things is when someone says, "Oh, can we do this?" I'm like, "I got somebody. We can do that." And here's how we do it from the get go. Yeah. So the end message idea is this, and here's the beginning part, and we're in both ends of it. So we help craft it from the start to the end. Yeah. And I think that's a big thing too, versus we hand it off to the TV production guys. They come back with a, what am I gonna do with this? Yeah. Versus I had the guy dressed up, he read the lines, it was good. Then he ran seven other pages of lines. Then I had to put on two other jackets, I had him change his tie twice, read the lines again. I had him do it. Stay, I, mean, I got the guy dressed up. Let's just rifle a bunch of stuff right. off, get all the raw footage I need. So when 
social media or production on the line is I had the guy dress up. We were good. We got it. It's in there somewhere. Yeah. So my four hours of production, I got my guy sweating because he's been working his ass off to get the job done. Yeah. And that's just that forward thinking I, I feel on our side is to where I'm thinking of this somewhere else, yeah. you know, like how can we use this beyond this five or 15 second that's thing? Right. Yeah. So you're, so in, in terms of how you work with your clients, then you're coming up with the strategy. You are also handling the execution and then probably as importantly, communicating the results to the stakeholders in the, in the client business. So how often do you meet with the client to talk about results? Is that like a weekly stand up or like, like how often do you typically schedule those types of things? Well, it depends on the, obviously the client and the, you know, then the communication thing. There's something I learned from a, a super, one of the smartest people I ever met that uh, you, you need to communicate with the clients the way they want to be communicated. Yeah. It's just something simple, you know. If you know the guy gets up at four o'clock in the morning, get up a little earlier. Yeah. You have his attention because nobody else gets up at that crazy hour. You know, <laughs> if you've got a guy that wants to work on weekends, make sure your phone is charged. You got it in your pocket because you never know when that opportunity is going to happen. That's right. I like that. So, yeah. yeah I, and, so and, I had a, but it does bite you in the rear end sometimes. Yeah. I, I love <laughs> that, by the way, because I think, you know, I learned that probably maybe the same way you did, you know, somebody sort of mentioned it and, and I started like implementing that in my daily, um, just my, my daily scheduling. And I always had the ear of the finance person, the CFO, because he was always an early riser, you know, five o'clock in the morning and we would be on calls at five o'clock in the morning. And I had his ear at five o'clock in the morning because nobody else was talking to him at five o'clock in the morning. And he actually had time to think and there wasn't a million things going on around him. And, you know, and so, you know, that, that definitely benefited me, you know, as we, as we developed our relationship so that, you know, I, I think over, over it's, it's easy to sort of overcomplicate things, but if you just talk to your customer, you know, or your client, the way that they want to be talked to and, and work within their process, then really good things happen. So I like that. That's cool. We, we are kind of like a little bit of a chameleon, you know, meaning as we're adjusting to that environment that we're in, we also try to adjust our speed. Yeah. Our, usually our biggest challenge is to slow down. Um, I have, a, I'm convinced I have attention deficit disorder. I don't even have the time to look it up. That's how much I'm convinced I think I have it, you know? And, uh, but, uh, we run at a pretty quick speed. Yeah. I, I'm, uh, let's get it done right. Yeah. First time. Yeah. So a typical new onboard client, uh, we usually get together every week at a certain time. And then it's usually both teams. So everybody can know what our roles are and we have our expectations and then let's get our results. And then we see what that result looks yeah. like. Once we get past a few weeks or months, we go to every other week. And then sometimes we'll go to once a month or once a quarter. Mm -hmm. And I have some clients that, uh, you know, like, Hey, let's get together. Let me just go have lunch. And then all of a sudden at lunch, you're like, just taking notes. I got all this great yeah. stuff. And it's like, I haven't seen you. It's like, yeah. come on, man, we're, we're here for yeah. you. So that, that, that touch point um, you know, it's, it needs to be really managed, uh, pretty well, which we try. So, so it's, I'm curious if you had to pick like one client that you would point to, wow. that's like sort of an example of like a really big win that you had for them. What talk me through that client, like talk me through like what space are they in? What do they do? What do they sell? You don't have to mention the name, but like, what do they do? And then like, what problem did they have that they came to you with or that you, that you identified and, you know, sort of talk me through that if you would. Well, um, I'll, I'll I, cause I, I think it was a three part, but the first part was, is it, was there something that we did that, you know, what was it was like kind of a win. Mm. And I think one with one client was, is what, believe it or not was sharp spring because we gave a extremely talented salesperson with extensive Excel spreadsheets and different colors and stuff. And we gave her the access to where she could now manage her own opportunities. Mm -hmm. And at any point in time, go back and forth to 
the life of the lead or communicate with that lead. And, and I mean, just, we pretty much just gave her like nitrous, nitrous oxide into her car and she just took off. So I asked uh, her, I'm going to use this one as an example. I asked her, this was uh, four years ago. I said, what do you think your closing ratio is? And she goes, what do you mean? I said, closing ratio. She goes, um, I, I close at least, you know, half of all the leads I have. I said, okay, great. 50%. I'm like, that's, you're better than 99% of all the baseball guys out there that get paid millions. Yeah. And after about six months, her closing ratio was 96%, not 50. Wow. And it's like, now that we can see is that if this person's interested in this product or service and you can communicate with this information, you can close the business. So this is something that, so now it's not, can you make the sale? It's don't mess up the sale. It's going to happen. We've done all the stuff right. We've got all the details on the website. We advertised out to the market to get them excited about this product or service. They've gone and they've learned about it. It's like, oh, okay, great. And then they did their name, address, and their phone number, email. I want to know more about it. So now it's your job not to lose this sale. I mean, they are wanting to throw the money at you. And with all these touch points, they're able to, a, a good quality salesperson, this is like the best yeah. for them yeah. because they have it. Now, all of a sudden, they don't hate advertising because I remember years ago, um, we would say, what do you want to happen? You want people to walk through the door? You want your phone to ring? You want to get emails? I want a phone to ring. Okay, great. Well, then we'll run radio, TV, you know, billboards, call this number and your phone will ring. Well, here's what's going to happen. The person answers the phone is going to learn to hate me because I'm the one that made the phone ring all day long. And so how do you get it to the point as to where they like what the marketing team does or the advertising and marketing team does yeah. for the salespeople? Yep. And if you can help them close, oh, they're on your top, they're on your side. Yep. So you, you've got, you've got a, uh, a scenario where you are bringing to them what I'm going to call high intent hand raisers that are saying, I want to talk to sales rep and learn about this thing you've got because I think it might solve a pain point that I've got. And yeah. you have done the pre-marketing. So like if we rewind and we think about the beginning of this episode, um, you know, we think about sort of pre-baking or, or pre-marketing activity that's happening. Well, let me rephrase pre-sales activity that's happening that is creating awareness around a particular pain point and then bringing them to either the website or just consuming the message wherever they're at and picking up the phone and calling, right? And at that point, they've already sort of pre-qualified themselves, right? And so so talk me yeah. through that. Like what, what, what would be an example of a campaign that you would run that would generate that kind of behavior. Um, and so in this particular case, let's just use the one, you know, that you just talked about where they're just picking up the phone. What, what does that campaign look like? What are you trying to communicate in the actual 30 second spot to get them to pick up the phone? All right. So, uh, there, actually I do have a work product that, you know, we did, we did do this with. So we had a event facility that uh, was drag strip um famous in our market and stuff like this and we did their radio advertising you know billboard advertising for years and stuff and i said to them we really need to be tv and they're they're like well you know, you know tv people aren't watching television i said yeah but here's what tv does on radio you hear this and it's just noise in your radio on a billboard when you see a car popping a wheelie on a billboard it's static and it's flat so but on television, you can show the six foot blue flames and we can show the school bus popping a wheelie yeah. and you can hear the noise and the view. And I says, now that will spark emotion. And I don't care who's looking at it. They're going to want to go. I want to go see that. And so as long as we have the website where we can buy the ticket and then when they Google, where's this track at? We've got our SEO in line or a pay-per-click in line. And so we can close that transaction then it worked and sure enough once they adopted that the this is a 28 year racetrack that facility event that we did was the number one attracted event they ever had they ran out of beer 
They ran out of hot dogs. They had nowhere to park cars. And at the end of it, they're like, there's too many people here. I said, well, this isn't going to work out. I can tell you that right now. Um, <laughs> Cause that's what we were supposed to do, you know? And so having all those things line up and, and using the right media with the right message is, is, is key. Yep. And, and, and determining what that is, is, is sometimes quite a challenge. Yep. Here's one thing I've noticed in the digital world, and I'm seeing a lot of clients, a few of our clients for sure. Everybody went digital, you know, oh, we got to be on Facebook. We got to be on uh, LinkedIn. You got to be on Google ads and all stuff. And, and, and that's true. You need to have some presence in those environments, but none of those environments get start the, start the interest, yeah. you know, an environment outside of that gets them into those environments. Um, we do a lot of recruiting uh, today. You, yeah, recruiting is just horrible and nobody knows what to work. And there's great jobs out there. I mean, really good jobs. And we tell our clients is you have to understand this is to where that person that you're trying to get to come work for you. The minute that they experience you, they're interviewing you. Yeah. They're seeing if your web page has got a misspelled word on it or the bottom it says copyright 2018, you know, or if you've got a social media, if your LinkedIn has, you know, 58 employees or, it doesn't even have an address to it. I mean, simple stuff like that. They're evaluating those. So having all the touch points working together makes the stuff work. And then you, your your ability to close that transaction, whatever it might be, whether you're recruiting someone, you're selling land, you're you're selling a car, you're selling a contract, all those things kind of come into play when all the touch points are are kind of in line. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That, that's a big thing for us. We watch everything. We try to watch everything. Right. And so you track that when they do come to the website and you track that through either like, how, how do you, how do you, so you're going to, I'm assuming you like you, you use like a landing page builder, right. And you've got your, your lander that you're tracking against, or there's a specific piece of content that you're dropping, you know, that people are consuming. Are, are you, um, I'm, I'm just kind of curious, like, are you a gated or an ungated like, like which, which side do you lean when it comes to sort of that, that argument that's going on right now? Do you gate your content? Do you not gate your content? I'm just curious. Um, I, I would probably, you know, we don't really use that term on this side, but I would probably say we're ungated. I mean, we are, are what we do, what we create for our clients or what our clients create and we distribute for mm -hmm. them or, or with them, yeah. you know, the whole purpose is to get the uh to get that next step whatever it might yep. be to learn more to yep. to get them to make a phone call yep. or go to that website and stuff and yep. um th with all the tools that we have currently right now the what i think is really cool is that when something comes up it's like oh we can do that yeah. just like that it's done you know instead of having to go out to another company and do this or do yeah. that and um the solutions like i said sometimes we're waiting for certain clients and so our solutions can be like on the meeting, we already have it ready to check it out. Like, okay, so we've got it going there. It's up there now. Let's look it out. You know, that fast yeah. sometimes it can be because all hands are on deck usually when we're doing stuff, you know? Yeah. So I, I talk to marketers all the time and, and one of the conversations that always, well, inevitably comes up over the last, let's say 12, 15 months has been this concept of, you know, gating content which has always been the way. And now, you know, there's a, there's a movement to ungate everything. And I am fascinated by that because I've always thought that it's a function of the value of the content. And, and it's the same as what you were just talking about with your TV spot. It's the message in the media, right? And it's the same thing here, right? It's the message in the medium. So, you know, in terms of like a lot of, a lot of content, absolutely should not be gated, right? You should be thinking about consumption. How do I get as many people to look at this message and the value proposition and get them to consume, you know, the, the narrative of what it is that I'm trying to tell them and, you know, how my particular product solves their particular pain point. Um, and you can measure that. You can absolutely measure that. Um, I am not at all discounting, by the way, that, you know, there's a question around, you know, do I get a lead or not out of it? You know, how do I get that lead? I totally agree that, and, and I understand that. But I think at the end of the day, like if you just sort of run the math and say, I want as many 
of the people that are in my ICP to consume my message as humanly possible, is that going to happen when you put it behind a wall or not? And is the value of the fewer emails that you capture going to outweigh the number of people that are consuming the message that you have, you know, uh, um, ungated, you know, free, free form. And, you know, more often than not, the answer typically comes back to, you know, is no. However, and in other words, not gating. However, you got to sell that, right? As a marketer uh, or even as an agency, right? You've got to sell that. You've got to know how to articulate what the problem is, you know, and what your solution is for it. And then also how you're going to measure it. And I think that's where a lot of marketers tend to break down a little bit or, or agencies is they know it's sort of the right thing to do because that's sort of how buyers buy. But at the same time, they don't know how to transverse the chasm from knowing that in their gut and being able to communicate that to the CFO. <laughs> right. And, and I think that that's always a challenge. So I'm just kind of curious, like, how would you are like, how would you, how would you have that conversation? Like, how would you try to convince somebody? So we're actually, we're, we're in a process right now with, with this challenge uh, with a client right now as to where their product is their knowledge and their product is their expertise. And so we're in the process of, well, how much do you give away before? And, and for years, people have paid for this. It, and it's, it's very, very high quality. It's a, the, the, the product that they have, which is their knowledge, is immensely valuable. So, so this uh, would be like a once they premium use, product or something, right? Or oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is world problem salvation, you know, bullet points. Mm -hmm. And so... We're in this process right now, and, I'm, and this is the way I'm thinking it through, and this is the way our team is thinking it through, is to where I want to make, uh, you know, a beef bourguignon with big French, uh, you know, meal, which is amazing. And so you, I show you the picture of the finished thing, and then I give you a product list of all the ingredients, but I don't tell you how and when they go together. That's, the, that's where the knowledge is, is to where how do I make these all come together to get that solution? And so how much do I give away? Or how much do I have to have in front? You know, you got you can't get the smell out, so they're not going to know how good it's going to smell. But you get that emotional feeling there, pain or happiness, so that they'll say, you know what, I want to know what how my ingredients are going to go together, mm -hmm. and you're the only one that knows. So I will click to the next level yeah. and to get into that. Right. And and I find that also with myself with uh, marketing SaaS products. You know, it's where because we're on, we have multiple channels that we use. I'm constantly bombarded from everything. And so I give everybody the shout out, the, the, the benefit of the doubt. The name of the company is It's All Good Media. And that comes around as to where I'm looking for the solution that everybody has. Yeah. And if you've got that solution that I can make my client's life better or more profitable is always the key, then I try to implement it, you know. But to get past this point is to where it's like, how much are you going to give me for free? The 30 day trial, the 15 day trial, whatever, you know, I'm going to give you 10 elements versus the whole thing. And then I have to go and commit the time to make it work, which is not the thing. You know, I want a solution that I can click yeah. through. So how much stuff is in front and behind is, is another key factor. So we're, we're in the process of working with a very dynamic client and we're, we're excited about this. And uh, I'll come back to you and tell you how we did. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be one of our next episodes. I so I, how about marketing content? Uh, you know, so if you think about, uh, I'm going to say case studies, things like um, how to guides, um, things like that. Uh, do you? What's your philosophy there? Do you want to put that behind a wall, or do you not? Typically. Um, it, I think it depends, you know, usually it's on, on my side, I, I have a very difficult time telling people how we succeeded. I usually can tell them exactly how we failed. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's really hard to say, oh, we succeeded because of this, you know, versus I, I dropped the ball here or we didn't do this connection here. Yeah. Um, I, I try to always follow best possible procedures. You know, we want to have everything win. Um, 
there's an old marketing book I have from the 50s. It says half of your marketing will, advertising will work and half won't work. Yeah. The, the challenge would be is, is you want to have the half that works, have it work a little bit better. Yeah. And the half that doesn't work, have it not work as bad. Yeah. You know, so right. so you get that you're 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 banking the house at fifty one forty nine, yeah. and uh, having multiple messages or multiple channels delivering similar messages or like messages that seems to seems to be really good. We you put a, I try to use this as an example. We put five or six people in a room and have them all pick the color blue, and there's going to be five or six color blues, mm. and and everybody's going to absorb a message differently. And so by making sure you have all those channels firing off or as many as, po- as many as you could afford, then the chances of closing that room of five people is pretty high if you're hitting on all the touch points. Yeah. The challenge then would be is if they're buying $19 oil changes or $10,000 pieces of property, what, you know, what's the value in, in winning the entire universe or just a couple, you know? So do you, do you feel like those are, pieces of like, well, how would you sort of evaluate that? Like what's better versus not? I, 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 you know, I'd love to be able to say, oh yeah, it's like this. You tie A plus B plus C and it's, it works every time. Uh, It's going to go on. I I throw it back to the client too, as to where number one business has to be getting better in the right areas has to be, and they have to see it dramatically. And so if we can affect sales, on a, a overall scale from five to eight or nine or ten percent, they can feel that and see that. They can feel it usually because they're running on a margin about that anyway. So you're almost, you know, really increasing the margin without covering, you know, increasing a lot of the overall capital investment or hard costs. And so with that being uh, a success because of the messaging or where you've placed the message. Uh, then you're, they're open up to a lot more things. And so it's like those extra, extra things on top of it. If we're doing a one client where I think they need to have 20 billboards in a market, well, if I can get to buy 10, okay, great. And that's going to give us 3 million impressions a day on those 10, but I really want six. And so when they get the 10, they're going to have a little bit of a bump because people will say, oh, I've seen it. It's, you know, it's, it's well, okay, we should do more of this and here's why. Uh, so they can see that effect. The same with television, you know, our effect with that is to where, oh, we were on the playoffs for the Stanley Cup or, you know, we're in the final four or on the Olympics or in the Formula One or whatever it was. And and their key people are going, they're in an environment that that I enjoy. And so you're, you've got that nice connection right there. Is they enjoy that environment, the consumer, or the absorber of that media, and you're, you're positioned in there. We also have... Uh, a lot better luck of staying away from price and item. That seems to bring a much higher quality lead into mm-hmm. the client, which allows them to super serve and super sell them. And from, from what we're seeing is as to where when it is a product or service that is above average, uh, they want to be super served. They want to be super sold the customer on, but then it gives that the, the, our client the ability to do what they want to do. And so that kind of helps us a lot too. Yep. And, um, you know, it, it you, you can't be everything all the time everywhere, but if you can be the 800 pound gorilla in the room from time to time, yeah. doesn't hurt. Does not hurt. I, I like that. I yeah. think you're absolutely right. So I, I here's, so I know we're sort of coming up to the end of our time together and I feel like I've got like six or eight more questions. We're going to have to do this again. But um, I, I guess I, I'm kind of curious, do you have a sort of a core uh, message that you typically like to talk through with clients that say, this is why we're different. This is why we're special when they're considering an agency. Yeah, our, our big thing is it's been since day one is advertising made easy. You know, uh, I should what we do in, in our world, because we do it and speak it all the time. Uh, and when I say our, we have an incredible team of superheroes here at It's All Good Media. I'm very honored to be able to work with all these great people. But it's it's really advertising made easy. And if you talk to anybody in business uh, and especially any accountant, I mean, advertising is one arm of this triangle. and 
they ask for that. I mean, the, if you're going to get a business loan, they're going, so what are you going to do for marketing? They all want to know what are you going to do to generate more money, you know, to pay me back or to whatever else. So when, when we make it easy, meaning is, is that here's a dollar you spend. This should produce seven in its lifespan. And so that's our goal is this dollar returns you seven times over the course of its lifespan. So that might be six months, six years, 16 years. And so, so by investing these, this money and the message is right and it's relevant, all these things kind of go into play. Uh, like I mentioned, recruiting. When I get people you know, trying to apply for a job from Columbia, we don't have a moving program. I mean, you got to be a U.S. citizen to work for one of our clients and you're in Columbia. So it's, it's like that was a bad, bad buy. We should not have been in that country. You know, it should have been just like, we learn those things. So making sure we're on the right point, but it's easy. So they can see everything. We're a transparent agency. So obviously with SharpSpring and some of our other tools, our clients can see what we can see. Yeah. Um, so we don't do anything behind the scenes. We don't have a separate Google account. If they have Google ads, it's connected through SharpSpring. They can see the dollar spend. Yeah. Same with Facebook uh, ads. Same with Perfect Audience, which is now part of that. I mean, they can see if it's $10,000 campaign, it's 10000 bucks, you know. And um, so I think that transparency helps a lot because you can't hide behind the numbers. Numbers are numbers. And yeah. if we're on an impression click or, uh, you know, call action, those are all things. It's the numbers. Yeah. So the, the other thing. Here's one that, that's been for us, that's been the challenge with COVID is we're in South Florida. So, uh, I mean, we've been primarily basically wide open for quite some time. And um, in some markets, some are still locked down like Beirut. And, you know, it's horrible to carry on business and stuff like that. So we try to forecast and say uh, Omicron just came around and we were able to forecast in different markets as it peaked in those markets. And as it's coming off the peak, we were able to see definite increases because people were starting to feel better. And it's like, wow, that was pretty cool how those things all lined up as to where, you know, business overall relates on how people feel and what kind of cash is on the street. And uh, when those things all line up, it's almost like try not to get out of the way to get this business. It's going to be there, but you have to be there ready to, to take it. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I, I think this, is there a, um, is there sort of a typical approach that you have to that or is it, you know, this is just how we, we manage it. As, as far as like a, a typical marketing campaign or how we deal with the client. Yeah. Um, I, I, I try to look at it on all points, you know, and, and I usually value with each is, is to where if we're, whether we're launching an idea campaign or they're, we're taking over a current campaign, uh, we try to get this baseline of where they're at and then, so we can measure that increases or decreases wherever they might be. But I say to them all the same is to what we're trying to do is figure out what's working and go do more of that. What's not working, we'll be able to figure out, but we're not spending energy looking for it. What we're looking, spending energy on is, is what is working and how do we go do more of that? Yeah. The other stuff will fall by the wayside. Don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Um, we had a client that... Uh, he says, I really want this billboard. And I said, okay, but so does everybody else. And, you know, come November, December, every liquor and watch guy wants that same billboard. Are you sure? Yep, yep, yep. Okay. And I, we paid double market value for the billboard because we had to buy it out from the, you know, the watch or the liquor guys for November and December. I mean, they're trying to sell the Rolexes and their, you know, and, and the tequila. And uh, I finally just said to him, I can do the same amount twice as many exposures in other in other areas for the same dollars. Give me six months, let me do it, which we did it. And I said, why'd you want that billboard? He goes, it's on the way to my house. Yep. That was it. Yep. And there was only like a few hundred people that lived beyond that billboard. Yep. He was one of yep. them. And I'm like, <laughs> that's a lot of money for average. So you can see your face every time or you can see your thing yep. versus I thought we were around to, to make money. How, how much, company. how much marketing is out there because of ego versus, <laughs> you know, and creative and placement is done, you know, due to ego versus actual performance. And it's, it's shocking. It's just shocking how many dollars are sort of spent doing that. Um, I, 
totally like I, I talk to agencies all the time and they they say similar things where they there's frustration around getting nickel and dimed around a particular campaign with a particular medium, but then like you will spend twice as much for half the performance on something else that they feel like they can believe in. And uh, yeah. that makes them feel good, you know? And, you know, as an agency, you sort of have to balance that a little bit, you know, because you are dealing with human beings at the end of the day. But I like what you said earlier, where you're talking about how you let the data sort of like do the talking and and you let the data do the convincing and in and, and it's very object like you lay it out very objectively and you say look this is what we're seeing this is what's working this is what's not working this is what we'd recommend that we double down on this is what we'd recommend on you know cutting out and then you you let the client sort of look at it through that you know that lens i think what happens is it, it sort of removes the, in some, by the way, you don't always win these arguments, right? You don't always win these, but at the end of the day, it really does put like, they know what they're, they're going into it with their eyes wide open. I think where the challenge comes in is I talk to agencies all the time that they don't have that view tied together and are able to generate a report that allows them to be able to have that conversation. And so what ends up happening, they, they, you know, again, we talk about all the different individual tools that they're using and they try to stitch together data from ultimately like, you know, four or five, six different tools to try to tell the story. And they spend most of their time in spreadsheets trying to create this thing, you know, to, to communicate to the leadership uh, or the CEO or whatever, you know, that they're trying to convince as opposed to actually using that time to work on campaigns and make things better. Right. And you good, can't good point there. Yeah. You, you almost can't do it anymore with individualized tools, even with integrations and things like that. You almost just can't do it anymore. And, and so you do have to have a unified database that does take all of that behavioral tracking, weaves it into something called, like, you know, again, like what we call the life of the lead to tell you what the story is so that then you can, you know, create a report that allows you to be able to communicate uh, what's working and what's not working. If you can't communicate what's working, what's not working, you're not going to have that client very long. Here's something that we remember I mentioned earlier about um, the power of if you have good salespeople, the value that what we, you know, because now we're not the salesperson's enemy. We're just the opposite. I mean, they can make their numbers. They can adjust their performance on stuff like this. And so with that, it's a famous thing as to where, oh, we do. How'd you hear about us? You know, that, that we ask every customer. I said, you ask every lead or do you ask every customer? And they'll say, well, yeah, when everybody calls in, how'd you hear about us? And then I say, so you on radio or television? They're like, no. I'm like, so they actually really didn't hear about you. They probably saw you maybe something. So you had like a billboard. So they saw you. They didn't hear a billboard. And so we're getting into that. But the neat thing about Life of the Lead is having that campaign of I saw a road sign or I uh, a friend of mine told me. But with the Life of the Lead, if they came in before that, you're able to see where they came in via Google. But the next thing I do with the salespeople is like, I don't care how they got a hold of you. What I want to know is the person that gave you a check how did they get affected by it? Yeah. Because that's the only one that I care about. Because at the end of the day, there's tire kickers. I don't want to measure any tire kickers. I want to measure the, the people that give our clients checks. Yep. And so having that drip campaign after the fact and after the sale, you know, there's nothing worse than you take your dog into the dog trimmer and they trim the dog's nails and you're just getting in the car. You get a thing on your phone that says, can you rate us on Google? I'm like, I haven't even gotten the dog in the car yet. You know, giving him a little bit of time versus... Yep. You've had a chance for a week for this or the two weeks or the three weeks for this product or this service. I just want to know, is everything the way you expected it? Yes. OK, great. Oh, great. Would you mind giving us a review? You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then that plays in along on that side there. But, yeah. you know, giving them the salespeople, because those are the ones that are like going, these are coming from this. I want more of these. And that helps with the when you have 83 campaigns going out at the same time something's got to get, you know, go above the other ones. 
Yeah. I, I think if you, yeah, if you were able to tie back your actual sales, the people that are handing over money to what caused them to show up in the first place. And you were able to tell that story and you were able to show what the, you know, the actual CAC is or the cost is to acquire that customer. And you're able to overlay that against what the value of the customer is. And you're able to show ROI. You can more often than not get the needed budget to go and accelerate that. Right. And I, I think it's, it's absolutely critical. You can't in this day and age, you know, really operate as an agency without that, you know, uh, I mean, there's always mm-hmm. exceptions, I'm sure. But, you know, in terms of like really learn, like getting new business and getting new clients, you've got to be able to, you've got to be able to show that. Yeah, there's, um, it, so obviously now with programmatic advertising and display and all this stuff here, you're, you're, you're a lot of stuff on bid basis and, you know, you think you're doing pretty good. Sometimes you're good and sometimes you're not stuff, but there are still some premium, what I would call premium web channels that have, you know, banner ads, you know, and just typical stuff, you know, it's $1,800, $3,500 a month to have a couple of banner ads. Yeah. And, you know, even though that technology has been, you know, move forward into the programmatic world, there are still some channels that are valuable. And when we can connect these all together for some specific clients that are selling products, and we're able to say, hey, we had 43 sales this past month for that $2,800 yeah. that generated $360,000 in advertising <laughs> in revenue for the company. And I we can't buy more. Yeah. I mean, we own the header, the foot of the side, the receipt, you know, I mean, we own everything. Just, you know, we've maximized this channel. Yep. That's something to where, uh, you know, we also try to do too. When we buy radio, it's like, how many commercials should I have? Well, okay, there's, you know, reach and frequency and all stuff here, but you can own a typical radio station for two, five, ten thousand $10,000. There's no reason to spend 20, 30, 50. You own the radio yep. station. Yeah. And so, making sure we're maximizing it. That's something that we're trying to do too. So that we like, okay, we've put all the energy into this channel, nothing more. And Google has been a, a big uh, challenge with that because they keep changing the rules all the time, but being local valuable, that's where we want to, where, what are we in the search environment? Are we, we have 50% of the search Are we hundred percent in this keyword and all these different things. And when we can measure that, we can say, Hey, listen, Oh, we're not getting any leads. Okay, but 100% of the people that are searching for you, we had a shot at all of them. So just so you know, I mean, you know, it's not us and it's not you. That consumer base right now is not taking the action to the next thing. But we're right where we need to be. So when they come back around, there's a good chance they're going to get picked. You know. So um, I know we're wrapping up here. I I was just kind of curious. Do you have any questions for me? Um, You know, I've been asking, I've been sort of pelting you with questions for an hour. I'm just kind of curious if you have any, if we turn the tables a little bit and ask any questions, like anything that you'd like to know or anything I can answer for you. Well, we're, we're hearing all the news about uh, the, the merger, which we're pretty excited about, Mm -hmm. you know, and, um, we're sure wondering when we're going to get the new email platform. Yeah. So, you know, I <laughs> love that you're asking the question because, you know, like this team is, when I say this team, I mean, the product team is just phenomenal. And, you know, so many of them are working, you know, around the roadmap that we're building out for 2022, we we sort of, you know, everything that we're doing right now is really sort of fed in from, you know, customer, current customer insights and, and having conversations just like this one. Um, We're very close to actually having um, a sort of a partner communication discussion about what that, like the big, sort of the big rocks, you know, on the roadmap are going to be. Uh, so I can definitely invite you to, you know, to join that. I mean, you've been around forever, so you've sort of seen the evolution of the platform over the years. Uh, I think you're going to be pretty, uh, it's pretty cool, actually, some of the things that we got planned. So I'm, I think you're going to, you're going to like it. Well, I could tell you this from being on the beta from day one, almost, yeah. um, 
And yeah, it's been our CTO seven years. Our, yeah, our CTO internal is very, very familiar with uh there was a guy, Brian, who did a lot of training in the beginning. And um, so we asked this bazillion questions seven years ago. Yeah. And we just, you know, our support for our clients, we handle direct. Uh-huh. So we do all the onboarding. We if they have a they go support, click, it's us. We answer the phone, we do the email, or we on site, we do all that training and stuff. And that was something so we wanted to make sure we had it internal. So yeah. that was something that we kind of really super educated ourselves to understand the product and the platform. Yeah. But I can tell you this, with in my world, at least five major rollouts that we've gone through, all the way from you know the social media connection um, and uh, uh, perfect audience and and some of the other connections as as well as powerful mm-hmm. tools that are added to it. Every tool kind of comes out right when it's ready. And it gives us enough time to play with it and to make sure. So we show clients what we're doing and theirs doesn't look like ours because we're on the on the beta stuff. But then when their stuff rolls out, we're able to yeah. be ready to go and say, hey, guys, this is the cool thing. We've already been on this for six weeks or six months or whatever. Yeah. And they've already fixed all the quirks. This is going to be here's how to make this most beneficial for you. Yeah. This is how we've made it beneficial for us. Same for you. Yeah. And so yeah. that's been super cool. cool. So your your vote is really the email tool overhaul. Okay, got it. Well, that's the only challenge right now. It's the only challenge, and I and I know that uh, the 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 big challenge that we have is Outlook, which is mm. wonderful tool. Thank you, Bill Gates, and all your team. Horrible tool. Thank you, Bill Gates, and your team. But at the end of the day, it's the it's the channel and element that yeah. you know, especially if you're in B two B or B two G, you need that. Yeah communication and your our limitations are so dramatic in that so um we're, we're excited about that and then uh just taking the upgrade of the constant contact power of emailing which is and again we've had clients that are on it so we're we're in that channel cool. and uh we know the phenomenalness of it and that's awesome when we can connect those two together it's just it's yeah it's yeah. nitroglycerin yeah. i mean I, i'm yeah, I'm expecting to get, you know, a 10% bump across the board just because we got a better DeWalt drill. Yeah, that's cool. You know? That's very cool. Well, yeah, yeah, I'll definitely invite you uh, to the to the, the sort of the partner communication. And then that gives you some insights, I think, that you're going to find pretty, probably pretty exciting. So it'll be good. Yeah, we're, we're always excited. Well, Scott, thanks for the time. I really appreciate it. I know we've sort of went over on time and, and but I appreciate the you know, just hanging with me a little bit. And as we talk through some of this stuff, because I think, you know, a lot of the con, the topics that we discussed are exactly what other agencies face every single day. And so I think there's going to be, you know, listeners that are hopping on that are going to be digital agencies that are, you know, very interested to hear what another successful agency is doing so that they can uh, just understand how to do things better, right? And and grow and learn. And, you know, I think that's what it's all about. So it's cool. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're excited to be part. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks, Scott. And uh, we'll, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Right. Take care.